So I'm going to like really, really quickly run through our info session, but those of you who are first years who came to our week of welcome event will have already seen this um, because I already did this. Um, so we have two sub teams. Um, we have public debate team and speech team. Um, public debate team does a variety of forms of public debate and speech team does speech and inter. So our public debate team practices IPDA and PDA worlds, so as British Parley, Collegiate Public Forum. Um, they, we go to the ACC for the Lafayette debate there. Um, we don't technically do policy, I think, that may change, um, but we do use policy theory pretty heavily. And I've got this little infographic that I put together during one of our previous meetings, uh, just introducing roughly what the different formats public debate team does on kind of a spectrum of what has the most case prep versus what's the most extemporaneous. Um, also with like varying degrees of prep time here. Um, so you can see on the far side, you've got WDC, so it's British Parley, uh, the collegiate version, not WSDC, which is the uh, high school version. And that has very little prep time, 30 minutes, no access to internet, cards, anything like that, and has that kind of seven minute, eight speeches structure. And then you've got IPA and NPA where you have 30 minute prep access to internet is a modern thing. It's kind of iffy and all your case files, um, but you don't know the resolution before those 30 minutes. And I've got, again, the speech structure for those there. Um, and then you've got CPFL and ACC, which have roughly like somewhere in the region of one, two, three months for you to prep your case. Um, you know the resolution in advance, and then obviously policy, which has a rotating yearly resolution. And that's a very, very quick introduction to the formats we practice. Do not worry if you don't know what any of this means. We will explain more thoroughly, but um, I'm just running through this quite quickly. Um, I will come back to this. And then speech and interp team um, practices a variety of forms of speech and interp. So we've got um, basically, if you know the National Friends Association pattern A and B, um, I'm not expecting you to. Um, impromptu speaking, extemporaneous speaking, persuasive speaking, original oratory, informative speaking, and then all these different forms of interpretation. So dramatic, poetic, prose, poetry. I already said poetry. Um, program oral, which is where you cut a bunch of pieces together. Duo interpretation. Yeah. Um, and oh, I'll be going over. Yeah. Oh, ahead. sorry. I just want to butt in. A good way that I would divide uh, speech is things that you write versus things that uh, have already been written that you just cut down uh, to form a narrative. Like with dramatic interp, you can, uh, or humorous interp, you can take a whole play and cut it down into uh, a 10 minute narrative, which sounds really hard, but we also have a database that already has tons and tons of scripts that are already done it for you but um if you're interested in cutting uh like specific pieces or plays or stuff um that's also an option if you don't want to uh use stuff that's already cut um or you could come up with your own topic and you want to you know write your own words um and that's pre-prepared, uh, that'd be something like informative or original oratory. Um, but you also have stuff that you don't prepare um, in advance, which is like extemporaneous and impromptu. That's just how I divide it in my mind, sorry. Yeah, no, that, that's a good way of explaining it. And this slide, if y'all don't know this, I don't know how you got here, but um, we're in this building. Um, it's slightly hard to find. It's kind of off the beaten track. Um, it's really hard to find. Don't let them fool you. If you made it there, you guys, good job. I'm a fifth year um, and I still don't know where this building is. Walk you in next week. The only thing I'm going to spend too much time on the slide on is we alternate between general body meetings and scrim meetings. So this is a general body meeting. It's 30 minutes of kind of meet and greet info followed by a 60 minute workshop. Um, scrim weeks, which is going to be next week. Um, is like practice, uh, which is divided between the sub teams. Um, I think next week public debate is going to be online. Question mark. Can be. Okay, public debate is going to be online next week, <laughs> and speech team should be in this room. So hopefully, Anna Calzini can navigate this room. Um, yeah, yeah, so yeah, go ahead. What about pause in the same time? And they the class right now. I don't have now, but like we might have an evening class for a test or something. Oh, I mean. You don't have to come to 
<laughs> yeah, no, we don't require attendance for members. Um, also, but like if it's like a scrim meeting and scrimmages, just like that, like everyone who's attending the tournament, so that time just doesn't work for them. Um, yeah, we can coordinate it and reschedule it. And even if like we can't be here, we can see if Sean is there or someone else can be there. The point of it's flexible. For scrim, scrims are flexible. Yeah, go ahead, Anna. If anybody uh, who's interested in speech uh, won't be able to make those meetings, you can just message me on Discord. Or um, I know we're getting uh, done with getting it done. Oh my God. Um, going away with uh, GroupMe. Uh, if you find me on GroupMe, you can message me on any of that. Um, just to, if you have any questions or if you want me to even like look over a speech that you've written or uh, like watch you perform uh, an intro or stuff or something like that. If you need any of that help, just message me and I'm sure we can figure out a time. Great, okay. And the last thing to say is um, food is reserved for dues paying members. Once they've had the food, everyone else can have it. Is there any pizza left? Yeah, there is. Okay, want pizza? if anyone wants pizza, okay. you can go and grab it. Um, it's, pizza. it's there. Um, we, will, we don't want it to go to waste. Um, okay. And then this last slide just has how to pay dues and how to get like on our roster and stuff. Um, none of this is required to attend meetings. Um, paying dues is like, gives you first come first serve to food. I'll answer in a second. And um, tournaments, that's the important part. You need to pay dues to go to her. Did we agree on that? We have not discussed you don't that. Need to, you oh. only need to pay yeah. dues if you want to. Yeah. I, no. If you want to go to tournaments, you have to be on the engaged roster. Right. Like, yeah, if you yeah. want to go to tournaments, you have to be on the roster um, because we are not allowed to pay students to go to tournaments who are not students. Okay. Uh, question. Yeah. Um, so I'm on the website and for Campus Labs membership roster, I can't find where to sign up. Here, I'll be. Turn your laptop. I'll, I'll go. Okay. Emma, Emma will be able to. Uh, okay, and that is a super, super fast intro to the team. Now, um, this workshop for a crash course in speech and debate is a bit of a work in progress. Um, I'm breaking this up into two sections. And Do you want to stop before? I think I'll just. Okay. Um, I'm breaking this up into two, two sections public debate and extemporaneous speaking, and then impromptu speaking. I'm not covering interp and a lot of other forms of speaking, but. You'll get a lot of info on that from Anna Consolini. There may be a separate workshop on it. Um, but this is like super, super basic generalized intro to debate and speech. And I'm gonna go into the specifics of some formats here, but I'm not gonna spend too much time. So I'll start with debate. The first thing, as many of you I'm sure know, that you do when you enter a debate tournament is you are, if you haven't been given it already, you're given a resolution or a motion or whatever the tournament chooses to call it some form of statement either containing the word resolve or the word this house would um, in wbc it's this house would in ipda it's resolved and then some statement um, now it's very very important not to forget this you need to interpret that resolution so it, this is really stressed in ipda and npda this idea of resolutional analysis but it still exists in worlds this idea of defining the motion and we have a couple of tools to help you do that. Um, the first one is what we call this tripartite theory of resolutional interpretation, which is a really wordy way of saying that resolutions can basically be drawn into three categories, at, at least in IPDA and NPDA. Um, these three categories are fact, value, and policy. In other words, is this true? using, you know, is it verifiable in some way? Is there evidence that makes it true? Is this right? Should we be doing this? And finally, what action would this justify? What action would imply this? What kind of policy or plan can we put together that proves, you know, kind of enacts this um, statement? So resolutions do not inherently have a fact, value, or policy nature. You, choose, you can interpret that into them. Some resolutions will be pretty clearly asking you for one type of thing. So for example, a resolution that says like resolved, um, uh, enact congressional term limits or um, 
in the CPFL resolution for this year or this half of the year is I think resolved. Uh, this house would enact um, term limits on Supreme Court justices. That's really most obviously interpretable as a policy resolution. It's asking you to justify a plan or some form of policy, in this case, term limits for the members of the judiciary, whatever you interpret that to be. Um, a good example of a resolution, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanna mention that that resolution is specifically for public forum. Occasionally, you're gonna come into people who are running positive or they don't give you a plan. So for that, um, like you need to consider, you don't always have to run a plan, um, but you need to be sure that you can justify why you don't need to have a plan, why you can just argue for the thing. Sure. Um, and that's a great segue into the other two inter ways of interpreting resolution, fact and value. So value, um, the easiest resolutions to spin as value interpretation are going to be resolutions with the word should in there. Like, um, I've seen ones that are like, you should eat more vegetables or, um, you know, people should pick up their litter. But it's just anything where there's an ought implied with an action, but it doesn't necessarily specify a policy. You could quite easily turn it into a policy by saying we'd enact a policy to make this happen or we would, you know, build a policy around this. But it doesn't have to be a policy. Um, and you can, if you're choosing to take it as a value round, you can bring in ethical arguments, ethical theories, do a whole bunch of analysis on the implications of this. And it takes it kind of a bit further away from this policy world of explaining a plan that has funding and enforcement mechanisms and all these sorts of things. It takes you a bit further away from that world. And then finally, we have fact interpretations. These are relatively uncommon just because they're kind of boring. If you choose to interpret the resolution as a factual question, um, with a lot of resolutions, it's pretty hard to argue that. So if you're the affirmative and you think it's a fact resolution, that's really easy. The negative is probably gonna explain why it's not really a factual resolution. It should be interpreted as something else. Just because with a lot of these factual resolutions, if it's easy to factually determine whether it's true or false, no one's gonna to wanna to do that. Um, and you just don't see a lot of resolutions that are phrased as facts. It's pretty rare to see resolutions like, um, you know, evolution is real or something like that, just because they're pretty boring. They're usually pretty one-sided. And even when you do see them, people are going to try and argue that it's some kind of value or policy. They're going to try and turn it into that. The last thing to say about this is particularly in IPDA and NPDA, the resolution you're given is not necessarily the final thing you have to argue. Um, there's a lot of room for creative interpretation. I think this is a lot less true in worlds, but in, I've seen in IPDA and NPDA, people are given resolutions. They come really creative ways to interpret them. Um, they'll be given something that looks like a fact and they'll turn it into a policy. They'll be given something that looks like a value and they'll turn it into a policy. A lot of turning things into policy, sometimes people turn things into value or fact. Um, and that is a really crucial skill. And we'll definitely talk more about how to do that. But the basic question you have to ask yourself is, if you want to turn something into policy, okay, so there's this thing, this resolution, what policy would someone who believed this enact? And if you want to turn it into a value, um, you know, what moral does this imply? If you want to turn it into a fact, okay, what facts rest on this or, or what facts can we ascertain? Moving on to weighing mechanisms. So, okay, you've defined what the resolution means or, or the motion. What on earth do you do next? Well, you have to tell the person judging your round how they should evaluate whether you've successfully proven that you should enact the plan or that it's a real value or that it's a fact. This typically involves talking about these metrics I've got up here, magnitude, scope, probability, quality, time frame, versatility, morality. Typically saying, you know, for, for this, I've interpreted the resolution to mean this, I think we should judge whether or not it's true based on a combination of these outcomes or based on some of these things. So for instance, magnitude could include, okay, well, I'm judging this on how big of an impact it has. Probability, I'm judging on how likely this is to work. Quality, I'm judging on how good the effect is and so on and so forth. And as a person on the other side from the affirmative on the opposition, 
or the negative, you can also inject your own weighing mechanism. You can say the affirmative provided us with this weighing mechanism, which places a lot of emphasis on magnitude and quality. What about time frame? What about morality? Shouldn't those also be part of our weighing mechanism? Shouldn't we also weigh those aspects of the resolution more? And debating over weighing mechanisms is often what happens because a lot of the time, the resolution will be, you know, policy and you propose a counter policy. It's like, how do we weigh these two policies against each other? Um, you know, we, we seem to agree on what we want to achieve, but there's different ways of achieving it. How do we weigh them against each other? What facts are we kind of trying to tease out here about, well, this is going to do this, but this is going to do this. How do we weigh these things against each other? So that's the basics of a weighing mechanism. Um, there's a lot of types of weighing mechanism. Um, like there's like benefit weighing mechanisms where you're taking a kind of a utilitarian view of which does the least harm and the most good. There's um, a lot of other weighing mechanisms, but we won't necessarily get into that too much right now. And then finally, you have your contentions. So you've told us what you think the resolution means. You've told us how you think the judge should weigh whether you've convinced them or not. Well, now you actually have to convince them. Um, for IPDA and NPD rounds, you're probably gonna run two, three contentions. These are just arguments, things that speak to your side of the story. Um, I don't know how many contentions, I don't even know if you call them contentions. You normally run the world's mishnash. Um, so I guess on whether you're speaking opening or closing. Yeah, so um, in, in worlds, it would depend on, like I just said, whether you're speaking on opening and closing or closing, because um, the way worlds works is our British parliamentary is you have four teams. And so you can't really like do all of the weighing or like list all of the contentions unless you're on closing. So usually that's something the closing speakers will do. Um, if you're talking about like Asian parliamentary or world schools, which is like a high school format, then um, usually the third speakers on each team will call them contentions or clash points, but basically some of, summarize like the key ideas. So this is something that I just think like world school. Okay. Great. And then obviously your contentions, your arguments, you know, lay those out. We'll talk about developing contentions as well. Um, but as you get into the later speeches of the debate, you will have your rebuttals, you know, counter arguments to contentions. And um, we call this a flow when you're stacking up contentions and rebuttals against each other. And then finally, you have voters, impacts, and analysis. So everyone has a different name for this sort of thing, but by the end of the round, there's going to be a lot of arguments thrown out, and you need to summarize to the judge what's been argued and what bearing this has on the resolution, and what 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 are the impacts of, of everything that's been established. You need to analyze for the judge. Yeah, I think the easiest thing that people usually do to determine their voters is to like figure out which um yeah which like contentions are like comparable to each other, and then do weighing. So you're essentially explaining to the judge like. Here were my contentions, and here's why I like defended them, and like the opponent couldn't really strike them down. And then here's like all of the things that I like said against the opponent's contentions. Um, so like clearly I had all of these points against them, and I responded to all of their points against me. Um, so like that's how I should win. And then you make your voters based off of like what you think your strongest ones were. So it's like, oh, well, I mean, we talked about like something about the economy. So I'm gonna make like uh, the economy one of my voters, but you'd probably be more specific. I just can't think of it anymore. Sure, so yeah, and uh, yeah. Emma, Emma's kind of hit it on the head here, but a voter or you can call it something else is you telling the judge in very plain English at the end of a round, here's why you should vote for my side of the argument. You may think, well, haven't I been telling them the whole time? Yes, but you need to summarize, you need to be very specific. Failing to do this is the easiest way to lose, in my opinion. A lot of the time I've run it, I've come into rounds, given a lot of arguments. The failure to summarize the way I see the end of the debate has been the biggest problem. The judge says, Yeah, I kind of forgot everything you said because you didn't summarize it for voters. They didn't say that, but that's what they meant. Um, in IPDA, people will literally say, Voter one, um, you know, math proves, uh, you know, the high magnitude impact and the way mechanism is magnitude, blah, blah, blah. In worlds, I don't think you'll hear the word voter, but it's the same concept of summarizing the arguments that people have given and explaining why 
those argu the arguments on your side stack up better than the arguments on the opponent's side. Um, so there's different verbiage all over the place. Um, it's very, very important to be strategic with voters. If you have a bunch of points that really haven't been running that well, it's fine to not really mention them among your voters. It's also important to realize that your voters don't have to be contentions you introduce. They can be side effects and negatives of the opponent's argument that have occurred later in the round. They can also be things your opponent has done in the round. Um, this is a bit less common, but um, in IPDA and NPDA, especially in IPDA, it's worth bringing up the way your opponent has argued and what is implied by the style of argument your opponent has used. So if your opponent is leveraging a lot of arguments that you think accepting could be detrimental, that's an argument in and of itself. The opponent's plan is based on bad ideas that are that we shouldn't embrace in any way. Um, things like that. Also, if the opponent's breaking the no, rules. No, you're not allowed to tell the, your opponent their ideas are bad. I got that feedback in a round. Yeah, you're not allowed to say that. You should just be like, I think Andrew is talking specifically about when you're uh, like, okay. whenever someone says something like problematic. Right. You can so, make that a voter. If someone like uses like very like dicey language, you can be like, yeah, one of my voters is that like the, my opponent is not very like cordial. They're out of line. Like they're not very like. That's part of it. Uh, but, like um, respecting of other people's identities. Like this speaks to a, a larger aspect of debate. Debate isn't just about convincing the judge that the resolution is bad or good or should be voted in favor of or should be voted against. Debate also is in some ways a sport. And judges in some ways see themselves as coaches and referees. And there's this whole idea that some judges are receptive to that it's not just about which arguments are better or which side is true, but also who you should be handing the win to and what set of ideas should get you a win and what kind of conduct is appropriate. So as Emma mentioned, if your opponent is being like, like obscenely offensive or they're they're propping up their there case. There's offensive like at all. Like they're propping up their case on ideas that have offensive implications or just you, that, that you can poke a lot of holes in. That's a voting. Um, and it's about, should we hand the win to this kind of argumentation? Should we hand the win to this kind of conduct? Should we endorse a plan that's based on these principles? And that is a extremely brief and condensed introduction to public debate and extemporaneous speaking. Obviously, extemporaneous speaking, you do not have an opponent, but it's very similar to a debate round and you have a very similar prep time and a very similar amount of time to speak. Um, public debate of all forms, obviously you have opponents, models, contentions. Um, there's, I assume all of you will have a lot of questions because I have left a lot of things very ambiguous. If you don't have questions, that's okay, but I'm gonna pause here because people do you have questions. If you came into the room late, by the way, like we can summarize everything again, or you can talk to us after and no worries. Mm -hmm. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, with like the speakers having their speech, uh, is there a time for us to ask them questions? Sure. So that's a format specific question, but the answer to the question is basically yes. So let me go a couple steps back. So in IPDA and NPDA, and most of these formats, you have what's called cross examination. So after you give a speech, so say, mm -hmm. Not NPDA. NPDA is the same. Oh, NPDA is POIs. You're right. Um, so in IPDA, ACC, you have what's called cross examination. So after you give a speech, so see, um, in IPDA, the first affirmative constructive speech is a five minute speech. There's two minutes of CX cross examination, um, and that's a period in which your opponent is is asking you questions about the speech you just gave, or just questions in general, but usually about the speech you just gave. Um, yeah, during IPDA, the important thing is that. Whoever gave the speech can only answer questions. You can't ask any questions back. You also can't like speak outside of just answering questions or asking questions. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if collegiate public forum still does like high school public forum where you generally like take turns asking questions because at the end of both speeches. But like if it's like in the style of like ACC or IPDA, if you just gave a speech, you do not ask any questions. And if you did not just give a speech, you cannot speak. You can only ask questions. That's very important because judges 
will like yeah. get so, very yeah. mad. If yeah. You so in that. general, as a rule for cross examination, if you're the person asking questions, ask questions. If you're the person answering questions, answer questions. Try not to ask questions which are basically not questions. You and know, don't ramble in your. You know when people like don't like give you time. like a whole paragraph and then they say, "So what do you think of that?" At the end, I did that all. The That's time. not a question. I did that all the time. You're not. You're not. <laughs> That is not a question, and people will get annoyed. Um, yeah, and if if you're asked a question and you respond with a snarky rhetorical question, people don't like that. Um, in NPDA and worlds, you have what's called points of information. So there's not like a defined cross-examination period, but during most of your opponent's speech, you can stand up and ask them a question. Well, you can stand up, and if they say if they accept your POI, they'll like point at you and say. Why? Um, like while they're speaking. Yeah. So what what will typically happen if you're in person? You'll you know most people will be sitting down. The person speaking might be standing up. They'll be speaking, and you'll you know stand up or indicate that you have a POI. And if they take it, they'll like point at you and they'll like go ahead. If not, they won't. You're usually expected to take you know, one or two, depending on how. Long the yeah. Format. There are certain rules like you don't want to take them. Like don't yeah, ask any at like the be very beginning or very end. And also, if you ask any questions, I think it's usually like 30 seconds is the hard limit. But if you ask really long questions, either the judge will just be like, you need to make a shorter question, or they'll just be like, cut you off, or just say, like, you don't have to answer that. That's not a question. Um, but yeah, and that, that's where you stand up, you ask a question during the speech, and they can respond to it, they can do whatever they want with it, and hopefully they address it. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Just call, like, the yeah. Sure. So. No one knows. Um, okay. No one knows. That's the answer. <laughs> Which you mean? The Which time? abbreviations? The the all the the, the, the uh, okay. format abbreviations. Yeah. I think. WUBC means World Universities Debate Championship. IPDA means International Public Debate Association. NPDA means National Parliamentary Debate Association. ACC means Atlantic Coast Conference. CPFL means the major public forum league, and ADA means the American Debate Association. And then in these speeches, A means affirmative, N means negative, R means rebuttal, and C means constructive. So one AC means cross examination. One AC would mean first affirmative constructive. It's just the name of the speech. And then these numbers here are the times allocated to the speech. I tried to condense this, but I did lose some information in the process. Um, this part is like something that if you sign up for a tournament or like really interested in learning a format, it takes like not that long to learn. Like, I don't want to emphasize this too much because it's not that important. And we can like honestly, like if I were you, I would just like bring a paper with all of the times into the round if they let you. Yeah. Uh, Which a lot of the time they will. Or you can just ask the judge. You can just be like, I don't know, how long does the speech supposed to be? Seven minutes? Okay, this one's good. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Yeah, good question. So obviously the format is different, but the topics do kind of change. So the BUDC is usually the most general because yeah. you don't have any prep. WDC or BP, uh, British Parley, Worlds, whatever you want to call it, um, they typically aren't like super technical because they don't. They want it to be something that you can literally walk through the round and debate about because you can't access outside information. Right. You can't Google things or bring in outside notes. So it has to be something that you could approach without outside notes. They do have like an info card um, where they like explain what the resolution means in case there's any technical words in there. But most of the time, they're they're pretty straightforward. Um, there are like trends in the NPDA and IPDA or like what type NPDA of NPDA is like it's very case based. Uh, it's like a plan based format. So if you want to write a plan, yeah. IPDA, I've seen some really wacky resolutions. IPDA resolutions can be about literally anything. I've seen IPDA resolutions about AstroTurf, snow, sports, um, sports. One time, I'm glad that you can Google that one because one time I got one about Kristen Cinema and I didn't even know who that was. Yeah, I just didn't strike it because the other ones were. <laughs> IPDA resolution can be anything. The way IPDA works is you'll get five resolutions and you'll strike a bunch of them until you're left with one. Basically, you 
say, I don't want to debate this one. Your opponent says, I don't want to debate that one until you're left with one. And then you debate that one. Um, there, there, there's usually like a bunch of different stuff there. So IPDA definitely leaves the door open to debating about more broad. Can, yeah, it can be anything, but like you have some control over what you're debating. So if something you're like, no, but they might all be the same thing. Like they might all be sports and then you're just sad. Unless you actually know them. Yeah, go ahead. So you obviously you're going to choose which one you're going to debate before the preparation, right? Uh, for IPDA? Yeah. 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 So, but it's like right. Yes, yeah, so you only have 30 minutes. Um, so the way an IPDA round will work is you'll arrive in the room where you're supposed to be debating. If it's in person, if it's virtual, you'll just log into Zoom or whatever it is. Um, the judge will have the five resolutions. The negative will strike one. So you'll already know who's affirmative and who's negative. They'll tell you. Like, you're affirmative, you're negative. Um, like negative will strike one, affirmative will strike one, negative will strike one, affirmative will strike one. Then you start prepping, but that happens during your prep. So if you take forever to strike, it deletes your prep time. But, but that doesn't. Work. Some judges don't count that, but I think it's just like. That's because they didn't read the rules. Yeah. But you might get lucky and get an extra, like, some people take forever to strike, and I hate those people. Uh, more yeah. question. Uh, do you have a follow up? <laughs> oh. no. More question. Yeah. Are you allowed to read chaos at NBDA or no? KF meaning, I know what K means. What is that? Um, like, a, like a critique on the affirmative. Uh, yes. Um, oh, wait, do you mean run a critic as the affirmative? Yeah. Um, you can okay. do for the projects, what Sean was talking about. Remember, okay. like you can, you can basically like write one case and be like, we think this is the most important thing to be debating, and we're always going to run this case for every single round, which is like kind of weird, but I mean, if you really want to do that, I think that's more of a Sean point. So, you're correct with IPDA, right? Uh, and PDA. And PDA. Okay. Or I guess either of them. I'm not sure. So um, IPDA and NPDA are kind of formats that came about because people didn't like policy. That being said, they are full of people who do policy. It's, no, IPDA is not like that. IPDA is normal. NPDA, those guys are crazy. Um, <laughs> especially NPDA, there's lots of people who do policy. There's lots of judges who do policy. So. Yeah. It really depends on your judge if a K or sometimes it K is a safe. Ask the judge before the round, like, do you accept ask K? Yeah, I mean, you can ask. Yeah, um, I will say um, in things like the ACC, they do not love that sort of thing because, and to a certain extent, IPDA because uh, ACC yeah, and I would not do that. IPDA, and IPDA I even... have an emphasis on this idea of public debate. This idea that debate should be approachable to everyone, that there shouldn't be any jargon, that you should just debate the resolution as it is. That's not universal, but um, if you ran a K at the ACC or in an IPA round, you would be susceptible to someone basically yeah. saying, like, Neg K, you can maybe get away with an IPDA. You should never run a K in the BBC ever. You will get. Is there, do people do that, Vishesh, in the BBC? No, not really. Yeah. You shouldn't. I, I don't. I don't think. Dumb. I don't even know how that would work. We should have done that for that one where they like the resolution was so skewed against us. That was like the one about. We were like, you should give indigenous people control over national <laughs> parks. Yeah, that was a really. Good <laughs> um. Any more questions? Yeah. Go ahead. So is it like is it one on one or is it like teams depending yeah. on? So IPDA is one on one, but it has a two v two option. The rest of these are two-person formats. I didn't even see that at the bottom. I'm sorry. No, you're okay. fine. <laughs> this is very info heavy. Worlds is 2v2, v2, v2. Okay. Meaning that it's a 4v4, but the four is split into two groups, and you are ranked on a one to four scale. Meaning you're debating against the opponent to win. You're also trying to do better than the person on your team, the other team on your team. Uh, and then like also so if you are like not sure what you want to do like how does that how does that work like how does it work like preparing for like the like, debates and like things oh, like that um, do you mean which format or the yeah. like, well, like format. personally i think yeah you can pick any that you want we'll just teach you like out of hat if you want i think ipda is the easiest to just like try and then the other ones then you can like learn more about the other ones and figure out what you like so um we mainly do IPDA and NPDA. These uh, IPDA and Worlds. 
these are on the slide in case people like extensive case prep um, and love writing really laborious. Yeah, but all of us are busy, so none of us like that. Um, <laughs> and I'm sure you can relate. If you were busy, I would not do that. In terms of IPDA and worlds, it really depends on how long you want to be spending digging into evidence and preparing evidence versus how much you enjoy debating basically without any like Googled or prepared evidence. I personally love worlds because I can show up to the round and during the round, I don't have to research anything. I don't bring in any research. It's just based on what I know, which means it's a lot easier to run less technical arguments and more moral arguments. Um, Emma and I went to a Worlds tournament and we ran uh, rounds we did well in. We just ran. We just ran philosophical. Yeah, we just ran philosophical arguments. Um, you'll see a bit less of that in IPK. So, yeah. Um, but like, the thing is, the reason these are on a spectrum is because they're not that, ultimately not that different from the ones neighboring them. It's just the timings and like a couple like verbiage Yeah, you should uh, like keep an eye on like the number of people though. Like if you don't want to have to, if you don't have a partner or like don't really want to compete with a partner, then I think you can pretty much only do IPDA, right? Yeah, I, I, I mean, IPDA is the only You need to find a partner. But if you like dislike that, or if you're like, oh, I kind of just want to try something by myself, go ahead. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Any more questions? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, if you have like two people in the same team, is it that each one has to do uh, their own like part of the speech? One does the opening, one does the closing? Or sure. So for worlds, each person has one speech, um, one seven minute speech. And one partner does one speech, one partner does the other speech. Um, for I, for team IPDA, I have no, I have no clue. I have I've never, seen it ever seen a tournament, team IPDA. and I don't think they had enough people registered to make the event. Yeah. So I would not compete with team IPDA. Team IPDA is what is this? Um, NPDA, there's three speeches per team. So one of you will be doing two speeches, and one of you will be doing one speech. And that's up I to- I think that's what the one, two means, right? Tech, I, I think Sean said that, that it you can do mix. Yeah, if, if you would like to know the details of NPDA, we can bring Sean. Sean loves it. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Any more questions? Yeah. Oh, you said that there'd be like online tournaments and stuff. There's oh, a lot of online tournaments. I think is it, we is only did online tournaments. Oh no, Vishnash competed. One. Yeah, drove to Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt. Oh. Sorry, what's your question? Oh no, like I was saying, how common is like actual tournaments? Oh, uh, in person there are some. Um, we had no money last year, so and none of us have cars, so we were like, no, we're not doing that. But one, if you have a car, you can definitely, definitely make that happen. If you don't have a car and now we have money, so we can make, we can like try to make that happen. Um. Yeah. So our budget goes through ups and downs. Uh, this club's been around for 20 years and it's always struggled with money. Um, we, I will, I will say we enter into a lot more in uh, virtual tournaments than in-person tournaments. It also just takes less of your time. You have to it's a lot more straightforward. Um, it's so easy. You just log in on a Saturday to a tournament. Sometimes it's Friday and you're done. Um, there will be in-person tournaments. Typically, the big tournaments in the spring that are like nationals, those are usually in-person. Um, yeah. Any more questions? Okay, I'm going to like really quickly run through impromptu speaking. This is going to be a very, very, very simple intro to impromptu speaking. And then after that, I am going to come back to some stuff about what we debate. So impromptu speaking is the format where you have two minutes to prepare and five minutes to speak. Two minutes, for those of you who attended Speech Fest, is a really short amount of time to prepare for a speech. Um, like, it feels very short. An impromptu speech consists usually of these four elements, an attention-getting device, an introduction, points, and a conclusion. Typically, you spend about one minute on your introduction, one minute on each point, you usually have three, and one minute on your conclusion. Points, in the National Friends Association, which is what we practice, are typically structured around anecdotes. In AFA, they're called supports. We just call them anecdotes. That's 
why would you invent a word that exists? Um, your, the reason for this is twofold. One, a concept is much easier to unpack if you have an anecdote to explain it. Two, it's much easier to come up with anecdotes than it is to come up with this. So to start with an attention getting device, you'll be given a prompt, you have two minutes to prep. You're given a choice of three prompts actually, and you choose one and then you have two minutes to prep. Attention getting device is the first thing you say. So if I were standing here to give a speech about debate, the first thing I say is my attention getting device. And the objective is to get your attention. Not to make a point, not to explain anything, but just to capture your attention and get you listening, get you on whatever train I'm driving. You do not want to have your prompt or your thesis as your attention getting device. The reason for that is it's really boring and the judge will see it all the time and they get so tired of it. Also, I mean, it's just a, a rule of like giving a speech. You don't get someone's attention by telling them, hi, I'm here to talk to you about blah, blah, blah. I mean, that's pretty boring. Um, attention getting devices, good ones are stories. So you have a story, you know, me and my friend Mark, we were, I don't know, moral dilemma. Start your speech. There you go. Or um, I saw this on the news or, or a quote, something inspirational. That's a good no. way to get started. Quote is very basic. Only do that if you can't think of anything. <laughs> Lots of people use quotes. I know. And that's why my debate coach would always roast us and say, never use a quote. <laughs> well, lots of people use quotes. Yeah, I know. It's because lots of people use a quote. It's very basic. Okay. Um, all right. <laughs> Introduction, where you lay out your points, you, you tell the listener what you're going to be talking about. So if I have my three points, I tell you what they are. I tell you what, like roughly what conclusion I'm going to be drawing, roughly what I'm trying to explain or say. Please do this. It may sound boring and pointless, but trust me, when you're listening to a five minute speech, if it doesn't have an introduction with signposting where you're telling someone exactly what to expect, it's so hard to follow. It's so hard to listen to. It's so hard to take notes on just because it, it gets disorganized in the back of your head. Judges are people. They have fickle attention and fickle memory. If you do not help them remember your speech, they will not remember. And then your points with your anecdotes. So what you're doing here is in your prep time, you're thinking, okay, what three facts, stories, opinions, quotes, things that have happened relate to this prompt? And what point can I make out of them? For instance, if your prompt was social media, you just think of like three times something has happened with social media. I could do Cambridge Analytica, which is when Facebook ended up accidentally rigging a British election. I could do, I'm sure there's more scandals about social media. I could also do anecdotes, a time when I use social media and it made me self-conscious, a time I use social media and it made me happy. I don't know, has that ever happened to anyone? Not sure. <laughs> a time social media made my life easier, that would be one. Um, all sorts of things like that. And those anecdotes are what you're gonna build your point around. Lots of people approach speaking by first thinking of their points and then trying to think of ways to explain them, ways to unpack them, ways to prove them. That's hard. It's harder than just thinking uh, social media. Uh, what three things can I think come to the top of my head? Stories. Okay, those three stories. What points can I make out of them? It's much easier. Um, and your conclusion is exactly what it sounds like. You can cut some time away from your conclusion. But you do want to leave your listener with something. You want to tell them what you said to them. So just summarize your three points, how they relate to your thesis or conclusion or what you're trying to say, and just tell them. Tell them what you've said. It sounds basic. It sounds like you're repeating yourself. If you do not do this, you will forget everything you've said. Trust me. It's happened to me so many times. The last thing to say about impromptu speaking is that prompts can be anything. Prompts can be images, prompts can be quotes, prompts can be dilemmas, prompts can be anything. And your speech can be anything. You don't have to argue that the prompt is true. You don't have to argue it's false. You don't even have to argue. You just have to find something powerful to say that vaguely relates to the prompt. I'm going to be honest, it doesn't even have to be vaguely related. I have seen people go to impromptu speaking tournaments and give the same exact speech no matter what the prompt is. I don't like it when people do that, but you can do that. Your speech <clears throat> can be really tangentially connected to the prompt. Okay. Before I move back to debate, does anyone have any questions about impromptu speaking? Cool. 
Okay. Um, does anyone have any questions about the date? Wow. Great. Um, so I'm just going to come back to some things I went over here because I, I very speedily went through this. Um, the first thing is our payments. Um, so I've kind of already explained a lot of this, but um, there is there are a lot of spectrums. Obviously, there's the case prep versus extemporaneous spectrum. I've gone into the ways that like worlds is different from all these other formats. Another thing here though is every one of these formats has a culture. That culture is not perfectly contained, but they all have kind of an intention behind them. So a lot of these formats were kind of made in response to policy. Policy debate being our big behemoth over here that's very prestigious and very difficult. A lot of them were made as a move to take debate away from a lot of things that commonly exist in policy debate. Those include excessive mountains of evidence, what's called spreading, which is when you talk really fast and throw out a ton of arguments. Um, very kind of prepared nature of it in and of itself. There's, there's, there's like a whole culture of worlds, right? Yeah. yeah, I don't know what it is. Yeah, it's, I don't think there's a culture, but there are like certain things you'll see like different teams do. So for example, like if you're an opening team, um, since you want to like beat the other team that's also arguing for your side, you're likely to like spend more time like loading as much information as you can in your speech so that they have like lesser points to bring up. And if you're a closing side, you usually try to run something called an extension which is like a new idea that hasn't been introduced in the debate so far. And so you introduce a new idea and then explain why that's more important than what the opening side has said. But if not more important, why that affects someone who's like more vulnerable than like the people they talk about and then kind of use that to win the debate. Sure. Emma, I mean, do you definitely you wanna... like all of the formats have like their own certain amounts of like quirks of like what kind of arguments judges like to see. Worlds definitely has one. Because like if, just because you know how to run like one format really well, it will help you in the other formats. But like you cannot it, like when you get feedback from a judge, you should incorporate it even if it's not what you're used to in another format. Like I remember the first round that Andrew and I did um, at this one tournament, we did so bad because we were trying to run it like IPDA, and the judge was like, "You need to stop." <laughs> Um, but the judge didn't want. The judge did not like our like very semantic arguments. In an IPPA, like you just spend me like half the round like semantically semantically arguing over the resolution, which I like because I like to be annoying. But uh, if you don't like that and you find that annoying, you should probably do it for else. Yeah, and part of what I want to touch on here is that there is a format for everyone. I personally love. Like I did a very small amount of it and I was like, wow, this is really cool. Um, some people absolutely love IPDA. Some people absolutely love MPA. If you try a format and you go, wow, this is really not what I wanted out of debate, try a different format. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of what I really want to say here is that like each of these formats cultivates unique skills. Each of them relies on unique skills. Each of them has a, a form of culture or um, kind of personality. Um, and we're going to try and help you find the one that you like. If it's not on this board, which I mean, there's a lot of formats on this board, um, we'll still try and help you find it. There are a lot of formats not on this board. If for some reason you're interested in congressional debate, if you've ever heard of congressional debate, please do come speak to me or DM me on Discord. There's okay. one tournament on <laughs> congressional debate. We're looking for more. All right. I'm probably going to finish up for today. Do we have any more questions? Or I finish up. Okay, cool. Yeah, Andrew, before we leave, we need to ask people. Oh, the next yeah. Meeting. Two questions from everyone. Um, one, do people want a different meeting time this semester? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I mean, yeah, I, I couldn't, I can't like do this time like next week or the week after that because my frat meets every Wednesday during this time as well. You could just change the day, like the same time. Okay, um, would, would people respond to a poll sent out about what day they want the meeting to be on? Okay, good. Is there a group here? 
We have a Discord. So we are getting rid of our group meet because it just keeps getting bought and no one ever talks in there. Um, yeah, we've tried to move to one platform. Uh, if anyone here doesn't have our link tree, let me know. Well, it's right there. Um, you need to, number one thing is join Engage. Number two thing is join the Discord. Change your nickname to your name and Engage and then ping me so I actually know, like notice that you did that. And then we can get you access to all the other channels. Yeah, I will say Discord is a, should be more commonly used, but it is not a commonly used platform. If you are unsure of how to do it, if you want to set it up like right now, we can help you do it, change your name, For sure. get Emma pinged and everything. Um, it's a really, really good platform, but there is a bit of a learning curve to it. So don't worry if you need to take your time to figure it out. Yep. Um, Sign up for their roast. Their roast thing. Uh, it's on Engage. Um, you need to go to the front, uh, yeah, log in, uh, go to the front page. Andrew, I think our, you might want to check our link tree link. I just watched someone try to use it and took them to the roster. So we need to make sure that it takes us to the front page, but I don't know if I'd be wrong. Um, I just was like that one person. Yeah, yeah, I think it takes us, yeah, that's bad. Oh, I thought um, I deliberately did that. If you like press the like, uh, like three bars, and then there's like a picture of debate. Um, yeah, you want to just like press on debate and then it takes you to the front page. Um, we're fixing that hopefully like very soon, if not now. Yeah. Um, and then there's a join button. I think it's a space. I'll, I'll do it one again. Yeah, sorry. What was your question? Uh, there was a question. Oh, I thought I heard someone talking. Okay. Yeah, also, if you foresee yourself coming back a lot, you should um, pay dues because, like, literally the only thing dues pays for is for us to eat pizza every few days. So, if you like pizza, if you want to eat pizza at this time, you should pay the dues. But if not, I mean, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, I mean, dues pays for pizza. Um, it, if there's money left over after pizza, we used to make awards for people every semester. Um, oh, and your shirts. Yes, but that's a question mark. No, that's Andrew, good. you said you're going to change interest. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's okay, good. right. I have more questions to ask that aren't this question. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, the next question is um, what workshops, if any, do people want to see? You don't have to answer this now. I'm going to put out a form. Does anyone have anything that they have a, that they would like to see a workshop on that they are confused on, they'd like to learn more about? Or do you just not know what you don't? Or are there like just, any formats that yeah, we have like an example? Of the debate. Yes. Yeah, that would be a great idea. Yeah. Okay, I'll I'll I'll, I'll, oh. I'll, I'll yeah. so oh, we should make that them. our next workshop. Hello? So um, on the meetings have two types. This is a general meeting. On the off week, we have scrim meetings. Scrim meetings, um, people debate or practice speeches in those. If you come to a scrim meeting and you kind of want to see a debate before you participate in a debate, you can just watch a debate for your first scrim. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, yeah, go ahead. Are these research? Can, am I? Can, it's, it's not. It don't need to be unless you want it to be. If, yeah, you, if, you, if you want to make research heavy debate, that goes back to the formats. Yeah. So you can look at the case press prep arrow. More case prep equals more research. The yeah. UDC is zero research. So this is the more research heavy end of the spectrum, and this is the less research. Heavy. IPA and the UDC, you don't have to do any research before the day. It's only in the tournament itself. All right. And those worlds, so, there's just no research. Uh, you have a partner for you. Yeah. Uh, world you have a partner, partner for IPA, you do not. And you don't have a partner, that's okay. But like, that yeah, I mean, okay. you, if you're like fine with working with whoever. Anna has a question, I think. Yeah, go ahead. Anna, you good? Oh, hi. Oh, hang on. Can you? Hey, where's that timer coming from? <laughs> Here, do you want us to come? You. Do you want us to come back to you? Okay. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, yes. I can hear you. Sorry about that. Um, I was going to say, uh, one of the workshops, uh, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, fuck, I'm so tired. Um, 
talking about the other speech events that um you didn't yes. get to go over um mainly like interp um and some of the oratories like um uh what is it original oratory uh informative all that jazz um uh yes. yeah that was one of them sorry okay. any other questions slash workshops oh, i actually have a question does anyone have like um, a format preference because during the scrimmage, I imagine that we're going to have to go over the format. So is anyone like really passionate about a format that they want to go over during the scrimmage? Or they want to try to participate in first. We could do a world one because it's at least one. Yeah, yeah, no, deep. There's no That's way true. we're going to people that want to compete. Let's do IPA. Yeah. 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 Um, yes. Okay. IPDA? That's so great. NPDA. Oh, NPDA. <laughs> Sean's gonna be happy. Yeah, you know what? I think we should make one of our workshops as well with Sean about it. Yeah, I was just about to ask what, like, you guys touched on IPA, but like, what is like the difference between that? And, like, and okay, so the first Maybe, difference it's is like mainly the culture. So the first difference is like, partner. So you have a partner in IPA. Second difference is the um, culture is very different. The culture is very different. The third difference is you don't have as much control over the resolution. So IPDA, you get a choice of five resolutions and you strike down to one. NPDA, they just give you a resolution. And but if you don't like do, it, like blacklist resolutions. And yeah, 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 but that, like that. that's that's a whole like process, and that doesn't necessarily work. Um, so yeah, um, NPDA, you are going to have to case prep just for the fact that like even if it is extemporaneous, most people come in with like a set of like four or five cases and try to like relate them to the prompt. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, lots of people come to NPDA rounds with a whole like I mean, case yeah. built already that they just run for every round. Yeah, you don't have to, but you might feel very unprepared if you don't have that. I mean, I, I can't promise that you will, but yeah. I mean, novice will be better. Yeah, uh, go ahead. So I'm confused for those of us that did Lincoln Douglas. So IPDA is okay. Actually, yeah, IPDA is like a combination between public forum and Lincoln Douglas. It's like less like um like of a numbers game than public forum, which is just like trying to like make you have the highest number impacts or whatever. Um, like you can make value judgments in IPDA. Um, if you want to do like, if, if, if the value judgments was like all you want to do, I would do WDC. If you liked like incorporating value judgments, yeah, into like policy arguments or into like, like less abstract arguments, IPA, you can do that. Not every round will be like very well suited for that, but most of them you can like incorporate value judgments. Value judgments, value arguments are allowed in IPA. And in fact, in some rounds, they're like, all you may Any more questions? Okay. Last thing to say um, is we have a couple of these polo shirts for sale. Um, we have not set up a form to buy them yet, though. So I don't know why the board wanted me to say that. Because well, you said you're going to do it in this meeting. Um, if anyone is interested in buying them, shirt, we might have those available. We're going to sell the ones that we have. And then if um, if anyone wants more, I guess we can give. But we need. But if people, if we have like no mediums right now, so if people really want a polo shirt, really bad, 